My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. It was a beautiful autumn day in 2003, and my wife and I were hiking in the woods of Rockland, Maine. We had been married for just a few years, and we made it a goal to go on at least one weekly adventure. We were on a relatively flat trail, and we were not expecting anything out of the ordinary. But a few miles into our walk, we heard a noise that immediately gave me chills. It was a deep, guttural wail, like nothing we had ever heard. We stopped and looked around, but we couldn't see anything. The woods were thick, and the sun was starting to set, but we decided to keep walking. We figured there had to be a reasonable explanation for what we heard, and that it wasn't anything to fear. We didn't have to walk far before seeing something that stopped our heartbeats. In the middle of the trail was a man-like beast. It reminded me of the fictional character the Hulk, but with black fur all over its body. It was at least eight feet tall and had a wide open mouth with large lips. The lips seemed so exaggerated that they almost had a cartoonish appearance. The beast stood there, staring at us, while we tried to understand what we were looking at. I'll never forget that confused feeling. And then it screamed again, this time even louder, and a nearby moose that had been grazing nearby started to run. It was apparent that the mammal had been trying to stay quiet in order to avoid detection, but the man-like beast was stalking it. We, of course, can't verify that's for sure what was happening, but it seemed evident to us. It wasn't long before the creature caught up to the moose. It leaped onto the moose's back and broke its neck within seconds. We watched in horror as the beast tore into the moose's flesh. It was like something out of a nightmare. That was when we acquired the courage to flee the scene. The running eventually turned into jogging, but we didn't stop until we returned to the car. It didn't take long to confirm that we had encountered a Sasquatch on the hunt, and we still frequently discuss that day. I'm so grateful that we got away. We both agree that we've never been the same since that day. I'm always looking over my shoulder, afraid that I'll see the beast again, and I'm still stunned that these creatures really do exist. I hope my story will warn others to be careful in the woods. There are things out there that we don't fully understand, and they can be very dangerous. I was sitting in my backyard in Groveland, California, enjoying coffee and watching squirrels play. It was a beautiful morning, and the sun started peeking over the mountains. Everything felt perfect as usual. But then I saw something strange approaching one of my bird feeders. It was a small, dark figure picking at the bird seed. It was about the size of a young boy, with long, thin arms and legs. It had light brown fur and big, circular black eyes. I had never seen anything like it before. I was just about to get up and get a closer look, for it didn't seem aggressive, but then it saw me. It unleashed a high-pitched scream, and it leaped into the treetops. I watched it disappear into the leaves and awaited its return. I thought about that creature every day for weeks after that. I couldn't stop wondering what it was. Was it a monkey, or was it something else entirely? I started reading up on wood apes and learned that they are believed to live in the forests of California and are said to be very shy and elusive. I figured the creature I saw had to be a wood ape. It certainly matched the description. But I was astonished that I, of all people, had the rare opportunity of seeing one in the wild. So many people search for these creatures for nearly their entire lives without managing to even get a glimpse. Then one day, I was sitting in my backyard one morning and I saw it again. It was sitting on a branch watching me, and it looked like it had grown a little since the last time I saw it. Its eyes were locked on mine, and I felt a chill run down my spine, mainly because I wondered if its parents were near. The creature just sat there, staring at me, and then it slowly turned away and climbed out of sight. I never saw it again after that. I've considered installing trail cameras around my property, but I have a weird feeling that that would be too intrusive. Maybe I'm crazy but something tells me it wouldn't be right to do so. I'm uncertain about what the animal was, but I know it was real. I'm not sure if I'm afraid of it or not, but I feel fortunate to have had such a rare experience.
During the winter of 1987, I was in Michigan visiting friends and I had decided to take an opportunity to go hunting in an area I hadn't been in before. I went hunting in a densely wooded area not too far from Wellston. The morning was clear and sunny and the temperature was quite comfortable. I had arrived at the hunting lease area at 4 a.m. to get my bearings, but being new to the area, I wasn't settled into the deer stand until almost dawn. As I sat in the stand, I surveyed the area, trying to visually map where I thought my first deer might emerge. I noticed movement to my right. At first, I thought it might be a large white-tailed deer or a buck stepping into a clear area. However, upon closer observation, I realized it was not a deer due to its distinct movements. The subject moved quietly and deliberately from my right to my left, crossing in front of me at an estimated distance of 75 to 100 yards. It was walking upright on two feet, and it was incredibly tall. It stood approximately six and a half to seven feet tall, and it had very long legs. The arms were extremely long too, and reached below its kneecaps. I hadn't seen any deer yet, so I began to watch this creature. I watched it for about half an hour, as it moved slowly and deliberately from tree to tree. Despite a slight wind blowing from my direction, the subject was aware of my presence, but it made no detectable sound or movement in my direction. Not too long after the creature emerged from the wooded area, the wind shifted. I was now downwind of this animal, and I couldn't help but notice the strong, unpleasant stench that filled the air. I assumed it was the creature and it smelled something like a mixture of frightened skunk and decaying matter, combined with a very earthy scent. More accurately, the odor had a combination of rotten eggs, sulfur, decaying matter, and a strong musky odor. It was very distinct, and I had never smelled anything like it before. It was so pungent that I needed to raise the collar of my shirt and cover my nose, trying to buffer and filter the smell of this creature. I'm not sure if this creature was frightening the deer away, but I stayed there for several hours and I never saw a single one. However, from the wooded areas, I heard loud gibbering sounds from a distance and deeper into the woods. It lasted about five minutes and the sounds had a very deep tone with occasional higher pitches. The sounds were rapid and it seemed like someone was talking very fast. I knew it was not human in nature. I could distinguish it from coyotes or wolves yelping and it appeared to come from a single animal, not a group. I did not tell my friends about the happenings of my first trip, only that there were no deer out. I was visiting my friends for a few weeks, and since this hunting trip was a bust, a few of us decided to join forces and go hunting early one morning. I eagerly took them up on the offer, and I returned to my now favorite deer stand. Much to my surprise, I had another unsettling encounter at the same location, Around 4 a.m., while in my deer stand, I heard vocalizations that consisted of low tones, and these vocalizations lasted for about five minutes. There were other vocalizations that sounded like nonsensical human sounds, but much louder and grunting. The sounds seemed threatening, and I sensed something heavy moving through the thick trees to my left. I also heard what appeared to be a loud cracking sound, like a tree limb being torn off, followed by repetitive knocking sounds. It sounded like two creatures were communicating with each other and were circling me. Each of us were armed with walkies this time, and I radioed over and asked if anyone else had heard the sounds. Two of my buddies said that they had heard something in the trees. The other friend, who was often worried about what others thought about him, denied that he had heard anything. I could tell by the quiver in his voice that he did indeed hear something and was not admitting it. After a few hours, I had to accept that there were no deer in the area. Something had frightened them off. I radioed over to my friends and I suggested that we call this excursion off. My one friend, who denied hearing anything early, suggested we walked around the perimeter to see if we could find any evidence of what the rest of us had heard. We agreed to check it out briefly on the way back to our vehicles. We gathered in the center of the clearing. Three of us said we had heard vocalizations and rustling in the trees behind us. We walked and searched the tree line. To our surprise, we found several sets of very large footprints. The prints were at least 17 to 18 inches long. We were only able to track the creature for a short distance. The deep and soft leaves in the area made it challenging to find any more traces. The three of us were satisfied in the fact that we knew we had an encounter with Bigfoot. My other friend objected, firmly denying that Bigfoot existed. Unfortunately, that was the end of my trip 
and I never had another chance to return to the hunting grounds. We had no more incidents like this one, and I was never able to get my deer. In 1983, I purchased a two-acre lot in the Westwood subdivision in western Tennessee and started to build my dream house. My brother was a licensed contractor, and he was helping me out. We were building it ourselves, so this was primarily a weekend project. Since we were building the house by ourselves, we often started before dawn and worked late into the evening. At that time, I was the only one building in the cul-de-sac, and there was no streetlights installed yet. We relied on the Coleman gas camp lights that we used for camping to shine light for us when we worked late. After pouring the foundation, I hired a couple of friends to help frame and raise the walls and get the roof on. After that, it was just my brother Wes and I working on the inside. With only the two of us in the house, we were able to swap stories and keep each other amused. Wes was a former logger from Washington State. To pass the time and make it more fun, Wes started to tell me stories of his Bigfoot sightings. Wes had always been open and upfront about the things he saw in Washington, and always had a story for any family gathering. Although our family remained skeptical, I wasn't. I had my own encounter with the big guy during my teenage years on a hunting trip with Wes, which made me more open to the possibility of Bigfoot existing in the wilds of Washington. Since we only were able to work weekends on the house, and were the only ones building, we'd often camp out in our trucks. On the nights we did that, we'd take the small Coleman stove and make our dinner there. One night, I was cooking outside while Wes was inside working on the wiring. I was crouched down and stirring our dinner when a really horrid smell came wafting by me. It smelled worse than a combination of wet dog and dead skunk. I put the lid back on the pot and stood up, looking around to see if I could find where the smell was coming from. It wasn't long before my brother smelled it too from inside the house. Wes came walking out and said that if dinner was smelling that bad, he wasn't interested in eating it. About that time, another breeze puffed by us, and we both instantly reacted to the nauseating stench. Both my brother and I looked towards the woods, knowing that this could be a significant smell. The sun was getting ready to go down, and we had the lanterns inside the house for light. Wes walked back towards the house to grab a couple, and I casually walked over to my truck. I reached inside and pulled out my shotgun and double-checked to make sure it was loaded. We were in a rather isolated area of the subdivision, and it was the weekend. I was sure that there was no other builders around. Wes walked back out and handed me a lantern and pulled over two chairs next to the stove. We both dimmed the lights in the lanterns so that our vision could adjust, and we could see better in the darkness. We were in an isolated area with a wooded area behind my property. We turned off the lanterns and opted to sit in the darkness and listen to the sounds of the night. Our ears caught faint movements of something large circling around us. The smell was still around us too, but not as strong as when we first encountered it. My brother and I sat in the darkness and ate dinner while we watched the woods. After an hour, the walking sounds faded, and there was no other incidents that night. The next night was a Sunday, and we finished up a bit earlier than the night before. After finishing our work and switching off the lanterns, we decided to relax in the lawn chairs outside. It was a moonless night and extremely dark. About 50 yards away, there was a huge ruckus in the woods, not too far from where we were sitting. It sounded like three large creatures. They started to scream, cackle, and make a whooping sound. I quickly grabbed my brother's mag light and tried to see what was in the woods. I must have spooked them when I jumped up, and they vanished, deeper behind the trees and out of sight. There was no other sounds for the rest of the night, not even the normal sounds you would hear in the wilderness. The next weekend we returned, and everything started again, but this time, I felt like the creatures were getting closer to us. Several times that weekend, I saw very large figures observing us, mostly from a distance. They seemed to watch us during daylight hours from afar. One of the creatures seemed a bit braver and came closer to us. I could tell by the size, shape, and way it moved, it definitely was a Bigfoot. While we were inside and working on the kitchen, I could see it move towards the house. It stayed closer to the trees and was about 250 yards away. The creature was at least 8 feet tall. It had a very broad chest and long arms. One of the things that stood out to me was that it had a very large head, and the forehead seemed to slope from the brow ridge to the back of the head. 
The creature would watch us while we were working and then disappear. I felt like they were trying to keep track of what we were doing. My brother and I both think that these were several Bigfoot creatures and they were only coming forward since we were moving into their territory. In the next month, more homes were beginning to be built nearby and I never saw them again. I'll be honest, I still sometimes have trouble accepting what I encountered when I was a child back in 1999. Both of my parents were very spiritual people, and because of this, I grew up in Shasta, California, which is said to be one of the more spiritual lands in all of the United States. I was at the age of seven when my encounter happened. It was one of the snowiest days we had had in a while, and because of this, the school day got cut short so that we'd have no trouble making it home before the roads became too treacherous. My dad was always the type of guy to make the most out of situations like that. He was a very responsible guy and raised me well, but he also had this very playful nature to him, like he was still a kid at heart. Thinking back on it, this made my childhood that much richer, because even though I didn't have any siblings, it felt like I always had someone around to share my passion over any childhood interests. Even if he was merely pretending to enjoy a lot of the things as much as I did, he was really good at it. He's gone now, but I'll never forget how much fun the guy was. It was after I got home from school that day that Dad told me we were going to take advantage of all the snow and go sledding at some large hill he had come across while on one of his many cross-country skiing treks. I remember how he brought one circular inflatable sled, as well as an antique toboggan that he had kept from his childhood. This is a little off-topic, but he kept the sled because of the movie Citizen Kane. He would sometimes talk about how important of a message the movie had, and I guess he thought it was neat that his sled was just like the one in the movie. When we arrived at the hill, I remember being so excited by how we had it all to ourselves. I could race up and down it as much as I wanted without anyone else getting in my way. I want to say we had been there for around 30 minutes and were preparing to slide down the hill again when we both saw something emerge from a distant tree line and began running towards our location. It was by the time it got close to the bottom of the slope that it became clear that the large black figure wasn't relatable to anything Dad or I had ever seen before. Whatever it was, it was running on all fours and appeared to be headed directly for us. I think Dad was so busy squinting his eyes, trying to determine what this creature was, that he didn't immediately consider it to be dangerous. Dad, what is that? I asked, my voice trembling from fear. Before I could get an answer, he picked me up and placed me on the sled, and together we slid down the hill. That might seem suicidal to some. However, there was nowhere else to go once you were at the peak of this hill. The other side of it was a cliff, and a chain-link fence separated you from it. Because of this, our best chance to get away from this creature was to slide down the steep hill and hope to pick up enough speed to get past it. We left the other sled behind at the top of the hill. I remember being so scared as we descended towards the creature that I used my gloves to cover my eyes from looking at it closely. But my curiosity ended up taking over, and I found myself staring through the gaps between my fingers. There was too much black hair covering the eyes, therefore, I didn't get an adequate look at them. It reminded me a lot of how old English sheepdogs look. You wonder how they're able to see anything in front of them with all that fur hanging over their brow. But I did get a good glimpse at the mouth. That mouth was so wide, and its pink lips were extremely puffy. My dad hollered at the creature as we slid right past it. I expected it to knock us off the sled with its long arms, but as far as I know, it didn't even attempt to touch us. Once we made it to the bottom of the hill, Dad nudged me off the sled and we both began to dart for the car, leaving the object behind. I suppose my father thought it would only slow us down while trying to get further separation from this creature. The thick snow made it difficult to run anywhere near full speed, 
making it seem as though we could be snatched up at any moment. Don't look back, Dad said to me, as he continued to glance over his shoulder. However, it got to the point where I couldn't help myself. When I looked behind me, I noticed that the creature was atop the sledding hill. It was pacing back and forth, seemingly keeping an eye out for something, but we had no clue what. It was when we were about halfway to the street where our car was parked that we crossed paths with a crew of men that looked like they were in the military. Hello, Dad greeted as we neared them. That was when he walked a few steps with one of the armed men while they had a little chat. They were too far away for me to hear what they were saying, but I wondered how he was describing to them what we had just seen. And judging by the soldier's body language, it seemed very obvious that that's what they had come to the area in pursuit of. I noticed that he gestured for the other soldiers to head in the direction that was a bit different from where we had just come. I remember feeling inclined to say that they were heading the wrong way, but that was when I saw my dad's eyes. They discreetly communicated to me that he didn't want me to say anything at all. Soon after that, the soldier with a notepad began patting my father down. When I was a kid, I remember thinking that the guy must have been searching for weapons or something. I'm now almost certain that what he was really in search for was a camera of some kind or anything that might have caused an obstacle for the government in this blatant cover-up. Eventually, they allowed us to continue making our way back to our car. It was when we had already driven a good distance away from the area that my father revealed to me that he deliberately pointed the men in the wrong direction. He told me it was while we were sledding down the hill past the creature that he saw the look of overwhelming fear on its face. He believed that all it wanted was to be left alone and that those armed men carried malicious intentions for the poor beast. I've always thought of that discussion as a profound event in my life. Sure, encountering a Sasquatch is the top of the list as well, but my dad's words were what truly instilled a newfound level of compassion within my heart. This species is most certainly out there, trust me, but I can't help but wonder what humankind would do with the creatures if they weren't nearly as elusive as they are. I don't like to be pessimistic, but I do feel as though we'd likely find more than one way to torment these mysterious creatures. Just imagine what poachers and the black market might do with their kind. I want to know what exactly these things are, just as much as the next guy, but I am a bit worried as to how much we might abuse them if we could manage to get our hands on them. Dad and I had many discussions about what we think they are, and if you want to know my honest opinion, I think they're affiliated with extraterrestrial life. They're just far too difficult to catch up with to be just another ape. It's my theory that they are dropped off on this planet and monitored for a variety of reasons, but they always get picked up. But that's just my opinion. I'm always open to the ideas of others, just because I don't think any of us truly know for sure what they are. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to share my report. When you grow up in a very rural area of Arkansas, you get to know and learn a lot about many different local legends from a very young age, and I was no exception to that rule. One of the most terrifying and the most fascinating of those local legends was the one about the Bigfoot creature that was said to roam around the countryside and in the wilderness, looking for people to terrorize and animals to rip apart with its bare hands. I know with what we know, or at least what we think we do about Bigfoot nowadays, that all sounds very unrealistic and laughable, but back when I was growing up in the early 70s, it not only sounded very realistic, but it also seemed very possible. I had never seen one, but I always heard the adults, mainly the men, but sometimes the women, talking about the local monster in the woods as though it existed for an absolute fact. There were a lot of sightings in my area at that time, and I think all the insane declarations about it were people who let their imaginations get the best of them as they told and retold one another's stories. As a little kid, I believed it all, and I thought that I wanted nothing more than to never see one of the creatures for as long as I lived. Unfortunately, I would not get that wish. 
But there's one thing I can say, and that's that it has more interest, in my opinion, and from my own experience, in harming humans than it does in messing with us. It was a gorgeous fall day, and school was just about to begin again. I had one more week of freedom before it was early bedtimes and even earlier times to rise. I had to be bused to school, like all the kids in that town, because there was no sidewalks and nothing but dirt roads to boot. The houses were spaced so far apart that even though we had neighbors, I couldn't see any of their houses from the property I grew up on. My parents had a small chicken farm, and that's how my dad made the money he supported us with. We all knew how disastrous it would be for us should anything happen to our chickens. I remember my first encounter happened when I was 10 years old, and I was out in the woods that connected to the farm, doing some fishing by myself. I have 10 siblings, and they were all off doing one thing or another, also trying to enjoy the last week of freedom that we had. Fishing was always something my dad and I enjoyed doing together, but it was the middle of the week on a work day, so I was left to fend for myself. My mother was in the house cooking, baking, cleaning, and taking care of my twin sisters who were just barely toddlers at that point. It started about an hour after I had gotten all settled in, and I had caught about four medium-sized fish. I was getting bored and tired, about to wrap it up for the day, when I heard what sounded like thunder to me at the time. It was a loud banging sound that seemed to come from above me and reverberate through the air, but it was so loud, to the point the ground below me was shaking. I started to pack up even faster, and that's when I heard a loud thump or thud, as though something had fallen out of a tree nearby and hit the ground hard. I looked all around, trying to find the source of the noise, but all I saw was something running past me, through the trees, at a high rate of speed. In fact, whatever it was had been running so fast that it looked like a giant red blur that circled around me more than once. I watched until it stopped, but whatever it was seemed to disappear behind a tree nearby. I didn't bother to go and try to discover what it was, because I was scared, and I just wanted to get back to the safety of my house. I packed up faster than I ever had before and got out of there so fast. By the time I got to the house, my dad could see I was afraid of something. I told him what it was, and he said it was more than likely a transient who had gotten onto the property and that he would go and check it out later in the night. Occasionally, we would get someone hiding out in our woods or somewhere on our property especially as the weather got cooler, but normally they were looking for work. My dad always found something for them to do and paid them in food for the most part. I met a lot of interesting people that way throughout my early years, but it was obvious he either purposely or unintentionally did not hear what I said to him. It was probably a little bit of both, but he did look surprised and the second I started talking about it, he started scanning the area as though he expected something to come running out of the forest. I rolled my eyes and I went into the house to give the fish I had caught that day to my mother. We ate dinner and us kids were getting ready for bed when we suddenly started hearing a loud howling. But it wasn't like that of a wolf. It was more like a bellowing and it seemed to be coming from all around us in the woods. Suddenly we heard a loud crashing sound and then the chickens started to go crazy. My dad grabbed his shotgun and ran outside. My brothers and I followed behind him, even as he yelled for all of us to stay put and stay in the house. My mother had her hands full and figured it was going to end up being something totally typical and normal, and therefore didn't bother to reiterate our father's orders to us, and just let us go out onto the porch to watch whatever was about to go down. He ran towards the chicken coops and we could barely see him, his back was turned to us as well, and then he fired off two consecutive shots into the air. My brothers ran back inside at the sound of gunfire, and I could hear the twins start screaming inside the house because they had heard it too. The next thing I know, something huge dropped down out of the trees behind my dad in front of me, off to the side. It was about 12 feet tall, maybe taller, and at least 6 feet wide. It had reddish-brown hair all over it, and the hair was very long. I remember watching it land there, after jumping out from high in one of the trees, and as it stood there, It seemed like it was shaking off the physical shock to its feet from the landing. I was immediately terrified and way too scared to scream to alert my father of its presence, even as it headed right towards him. My father was dealing with his own issues as the coops had all been broken, 
And I remember thinking it was weird that we could obviously see that from where he and I were standing, and yet he wasn't making a move to go and fix them or round the chickens back up. My legs were trembling, and I finally yelled for my father. He didn't listen to me, though, and merely turned quickly to tell me to get back into the house. I ran up to him instead the whole time the creature was walking towards him. The closer it got to him, the slower and more hesitant it seemed to become. I noticed immediately that there was another one and it had come down from a tree right in front of my dad, probably when he had fired the shots into the air. We both watched in awe and horror as the two beings walked towards one another and then turned and walked into the woods, side by side and with both glancing back at us just one time. My father had his gun aimed at them, but for whatever reason, he wasn't firing. He would later say that he wanted to shoot them, and he was trying his hardest. But his brain could not make the connection to his trigger finger for him to pull it. The creatures turned to look at us, and then they stopped and completely turned around. They roared at us in unison, and that's when my father lowered his gun and yelled for me to run. I didn't have to be told twice, and I just did it. And my dad was close behind me. We had a few yards, maybe a little more, to run before we could get inside the house into safety, but before we made it there, even though we were running as fast as we possibly could, we heard something very strange coming from the forest. It sounded like there were twenty or more creatures, ones that we didn't recognize as anything familiar, and they were all yelling and bellowing throughout the forest. The sound echoed all around us, and it was like a symphony of terror, because it made us both stop short in our tracks and cover our ears. The two Bigfoot creatures behind us, the ones we had once again turned to face, started banging on the trees around them, each fist hitting a different tree. Their arms were so long and hung down past their knees, so it wasn't that much of a surprise when they were able to do that. They then made the same exact noises as whatever was in the woods, and that's when we put it together that there was a lot more of these creatures, the Bigfoot, and they were all communicating something to one another, or possibly to us. It all sounded very threatening and very angry. Dad and I quickly walked to the house and then went inside. My dad must have been scared out of his mind, or possibly extremely confused, because he refused to talk about it, even to my mom. I wasn't allowed to mention it, but I only followed that rule when he was around, and otherwise told everyone and anyone that would listen. Most people believed me, and I got in a lot of trouble for stirring things up in our community. It would take more than a month for our neighbors and random townsfolk to stop showing up on our property with guns, trying to convince my parents to let them hunt the creatures down and kill them. They tried to tell my parents that the beings were dangerous to the chickens, and therefore their livelihood, but they stood firm, my parents, and looking back on it, I realized how hard that must have been to do, especially in a town like the one I grew up in. The following day, my dad made us all stay home and inside the house while he had one of our closest neighbors a man who he was very good friends with, go into the woods near where I was fishing to check out my story. Apparently, and I was told this more than once, I was allowed to talk about it in front of that one neighbor, but I didn't understand why until later. My father sat me down and had the talk with me about the difference between a truth and a lie and had me repeat it for him. After I did, he looked pale and startled, and that's when he and his friend got together and went into the woods. It was just about dusk when they left. They found the same footprints in those woods that they had all around our property, and especially under the trees from which the creatures had jumped or fallen from. There were footprints that were 17 and 3 quarter inches long. In the woods by the fishing creek, where I had seen one running so fast it became a big blur, there were also the same type of footprints, the exact same size, that looked like someone tried to sweep or wipe them away. This makes me wonder if Bigfoot knows how to cover its tracks. I know now that Bigfoot is often something peaceful, who would really rather not bother with human beings at all, but can also be extremely aggressive when just approached. I think the Bigfoot wanted our chickens, and I wonder if maybe food was becoming scarce in that area at the time. Obviously, I will never know, because it's not like I can just go and ask them. I saw glimpses of them here and there for years after that, and most people in that area, whose properties and homes lined up and shared those woods with us, also saw them. That's about all I know. 
I think nowadays I would be more open and receptive to maybe trying to communicate with one of them, should they happen to merely fall out of a tree or run into a dimension right before my very eyes. But since I stopped seeing them in the late 80s, I don't know if I'll ever be so lucky again. And I might have missed my chance. There's a part of me too that wonders if it would attack me or something like that. So I always make sure to respect my environment, no matter where I am, but especially when I am anywhere in the woods, or another creature's territory. That's all I've got for now, but I hope one day that I can write in with a more recent story. Well, maybe that's what I hope. I'm not too sure. My son-in-law and I were out running our hounds in a coon hunt that night. The area we were in stretched far beyond Green Lake, extending into the Hickey Marsh. Little did we know that this particular night would be etched into our memory forever. As we parked our vehicles, preparing for the hunt, I couldn't help but notice the remains of partridges scattered all around. It didn't strike me as anything out of the ordinary at the time. Our hounds, full of energy and excitement, were eager to get started. I released a young and proven hound both displaying immense determination and fearlessness. Something in my gut told me that we might not be chasing coons that night. It felt more like a bobcat was on the prowl. Sure enough, after about 20 minutes, the hounds signaled that they had treed. We made our way towards them, but just before we reached the tree, the creature bailed, much like a cat would when it catches sight of lights at night, or a bear when we pursue them. Undeterred, the dogs pulled themselves together and resumed the chase leading us deeper into the wilderness. Sensing the need for caution, my son-in-law decided to return to the truck, ready to call me out if necessary. I kept the tracker with me, venturing further into the marsh, where a dense blend of spruce, cedar, bog, and popple surrounded me. The dogs had treed deep within this maze of brush. In search of a vantage point to better hear their barks, I climbed a high spot, a thickly wooded ridge, my radio tracker struggled to pick up their signals, as well as the extra collar left at the truck. Its range, in such densely forested areas, was limited to around seven miles. I slowly swung the tracker, hoping to catch a stronger reading. Amidst the hunt, a foul odor wafted through the air. At first I dismissed it, assuming it was simply my own scent after multiple encounters with swamp muck. But as I swung the tracker, its coon light illuminating the path of the antenna, my gaze fell upon a pair of eyes, nestled among the spruce trees, right next to a deer trail on the ridge. As a seasoned coon hunter, I had seen my fair share of eye shine in the darkness. However, this sighting gave me pause. I shrugged it off momentarily and swung the tracker back, only to find the trail before me filled with a creature standing merely 20 feet away. This being stood at an astonishing height of around 8 feet, boasting long arms with distinct fingers, a barrel chest, and a pot belly. Its eyes, deeply set and intense, locked onto mine, while its mouth hung open. Strangely enough, its ears appeared small in proportion to its massive frame. Time seemed to stand still as I stood frozen, my hound's call forgotten in the face of the surreal encounter. I couldn't tear my eyes away as the creature wrapped its hand around a large spruce tree. Its hair, a blend of black and brown, was neither long nor short, while its nose appeared flat, and its face lacked the same hair coverage as its body. I can't quite recall how it departed from the scene, but the lingering smell followed me almost all the way back to the truck. My son-in-law met me, and he jokingly commented about me passing gas, unaware of the terror that had just unfolded. I struggled to regain composure as we made our way back, doubting the accuracy of my tracking system and questioning the reliability of my compass. The path we took back wasn't the straightest. The encounter had left me disoriented. To this day, I haven't mustered the courage to run my hounds in that area again, whether it be for coons or bears. Moreover, it remains the only time I have left my beloved hounds alone in the woods. The following morning, after getting some much-needed rest, I ventured back up there, my nerves on edge, in a desperate attempt to locate my hounds by myself as my son-in-law had to go to work. Thank the Lord, I found them treed on the beech woods, just 30 feet off the gravel road, with the most beautiful sleeping bobcat perched in a tree.
At one point in my life, I lived in a town about 20 miles outside of Tacoma, Washington. So I was dating this guy named Travis at the time. He was one of those types who seemed to live off frequent adrenaline rushes. It's pretty hard for me to imagine a more intense thrill than what I went through on our final date. Travis showed up at my front doorstep with flowers and asked if I wanted to go mudding. If you're not familiar with the activity, it's where you take an off-road vehicle into a muddy terrain and drive like a psychopath. Well, that's what we did, only that was far from the most worrisome part of the day. I'm going to show you a secret, Travis said with a grin when we were only a few minutes from the scene. He didn't elaborate any further than that, so I assumed he was referring to the location of where we were headed. We ended up in this open field that had a lot of fallen trees everywhere. It was a cloudy, gloomy day, and I remember thinking that the sky looked like it wasn't long before a storm was going to come through the area. Let's maybe head back before the bad weather I suggested. But Travis responded with yet another vague statement. Not before I show you something that's going to change your life. It wasn't long after that he parked his Jeep Wrangler near the edge of the woods and stepped around to the vehicle's rear. He then opened the trunk and extracted something heavy from the back. I was still sitting in the passenger seat, so I couldn't see what he was tampering with. He started tossing items towards the edge of the woods, which I soon recognized as slabs of meat. What are you doing that for? I called out, very weirded out by this action. The truth is, I was already thinking about breaking up with him, and the strangeness of this event wasn't doing much to help reverse that intent. It was only a few minutes later that Travis re-entered his vehicle that it emerged from the woods. Initially, I thought it was an ogre or a troll or something. The size alone made it impossible for it to be a mere human in a costume. I gasped before covering my mouth out of fear that this ugly thing was going to notice me. Of course, we were in plain view, but I didn't want to draw any extra attention my way. The visual of the creature crumbled my reality. Looking at it, made my brain feel as though it was short-circuiting. It just didn't make any sense. How could it be? To make matters worse, Travis stepped on the gas pedal, bringing us closer to this ugly giant. Getting closer to this thing was the most undesirable thing I could imagine. Travis swerved to the left of the beast after it had started examining one of the meat packages. This caused mud to spray all over its light brown fur. Oh my god, what is wrong with you? I couldn't help but scream at Travis, and it was so obnoxious how he maintained some cocky grin. The beast, that I now know to be a Bigfoot, unleashed a snarl right before chasing after us. By the time I turned around, it was already down on all fours, scrambling towards us. It moved in a way that reminded me of a crab, only much, much faster. And even over the sound of Travis's engine, I could hear the beast making these bizarre gurgling noises. It made it sound like its lungs led to an endless abyss. I wish someone could clarify for me how that works. I'm not sure I'm elaborating on that properly. It's probably one of those things you have to experience to get the gist. The ride had become so turbulent by this point, and I'm so thankful I took the initiative to buckle my seatbelt, because otherwise, I for sure would have gotten launched from the vehicle. Can you believe it? Travis shouted as he glanced at me with this excited look. The beast wasn't even that far from us because my idiot driver was swerving all over the place. Can you imagine what would have happened had the vehicle tipped or the engine had broken down? We both would have gotten ripped to pieces. I remember thinking how the forearms on this creature looked wider than the Jeep's off-road tires. It had to have had incredible strength. I shouted at Travis to get us out of there, now more afraid than I had ever thought was possible. Travis looked at me like he was hurt. It was a look that conveyed he was letting me in on some intimate secret, and I was rejecting him for it. But all I could think about was getting as far away from that place as possible. It very much felt like we had intruded on some psycho's property, only that psycho just happened to be an actual monster that I never thought before existed. I was finally able to breathe a sigh of relief when I noticed that the beast had stopped trailing us. Once we started driving in a straight line, it seemed to recognize that it couldn't catch up to us. Regardless, I think it just really wanted the noisy vehicle to go away so that it could tend to the meat slabs undisturbed. How long have you known that that thing is over there, I said after we arrived back on the main road. 
You're not going to go telling anyone about that, are you? He said, disregarding my question completely. He then had a look in his eyes, like he was worried he had made a colossal mistake. The audacity he must have had to think that he could expose that monster, risk my life, and then expect me not to tell anyone was more than foolish. Are you out of your mind? I said, fuming. You so easily could have gotten us both killed. What even was that thing? My uncle thinks it's a Sasquatch, Travis replied, now with a much more serious tone. A Sas what? I remarked, never having heard the word before. That probably sounds strange, given where I'm from, but I had never before expressed any interest in that kind of stuff. Frankly, the subject of cryptids flew way under my radar. A Sasquatch, Travis repeated. You could say it's another word for Bigfoot. The whole experience felt so out of nowhere that I ended up at a loss for words. Look, you can't tell anyone about this, Travis then said, breaking a brief period of silence. My family would kill me. I now wish I would have asked him to elaborate further on that, but I was so upset with the guy for risking my life, and I just wanted to get away from him. I broke up with him after he dropped me off at my house, and I was shaken up for probably about a week. I told my parents all about what happened, but I never felt like they really believed me. It felt like they were a bit condescending, and it irritated me because it made me feel like I was talking to a wall. I had nobody to vent to about the matter. There was no way I would tell my friend group about it because they never in a million years would have believed me. They were the type of girls who probably would have disowned me over such a claim and then spread nasty rumors about me. This whole debacle made me appreciate what so many other people must go through. Like, honestly, who do you tell about these encounters? After I got older, I stopped feeling insecure about telling people, and I wrote to a few networks that broadcast Bigfoot-related content. I never heard back from any of them, which leads me to suspect that maybe they don't take the subject as seriously as some people think. Sometimes I even wonder if the people that share their encounter stories on shows are all actors, Otherwise, how does the network even find these people? So many of them claim to be from the middle of nowhere. The chances of them getting in touch with TV studios seems pretty slim. Thank you for your interest in my encounter. In the early morning hours of March 2016, I found myself in a small fishing boat with two companions, quietly navigating the waters of Old Mill Lake located near the Missouri River. Having spent less than an hour on the water, it started to smell really gross. We all began to look around, wondering where it was coming from. It was only a few minutes until I spotted it. I noticed movement in the forest to the north. I nudged my friends and I told them to look over towards the trees. And there, all three of us saw a huge figure. It was standing on the bank, in between the water and the woods. It was huge, and it was standing on two long legs. It looked like it had never been clean a day in its life, and that's where we suspected the smell was coming from. I watched it for a second as it squatted down at the edge of the water. It looked like it was drinking. I could see its hand dip into the water and then come back up to its face, and then suddenly, like it just became aware that it was being watched, it jumped straight up and looked in our direction. We were too far out into the lake to really be noticed, unless it had an unbelievable eyesight. None of us could believe what we were seeing. We estimated the creature to be standing at least eight feet tall, and it had really long arms with very large hands. It didn't really seem to have a neck, but it had very broad shoulders and a huge head. After a moment, I realized it wasn't looking at us. It appeared to be engrossed in something on the bank behind us. My friend Joe couldn't keep quiet, and he raised his voice and started yelling at it. Joe's shouting brought the creature's attention right to us. The creature reacted quickly when it heard us and made a loud sound, almost a combination of a growl and a roar. The sound echoed through the area and then bounced off the trees. The creature then turned around and ran up the bank and disappeared into the forest. Since we were beyond the center of the lake, we weren't close enough to see real facial features. One thing we could all agree on was that when the creature turned and began running up the bank, its arms were swinging and almost limp as it moved and made its way back into the woods. Two of us remember the creature having very long legs, and my other friend doesn't really remember any details at all. 
We all agree that it was covered in grayish hair, all over, except for the face. When it made that loud scream, I was able to see several long and sharp-looking teeth, almost wolf-like in sharpness. Unfortunately, the sighting lasted no more than ten seconds. The three of us were left stunned, wondering what we had just seen. We decided to relocate to another part of the lake to continue fishing. We spent the next several hours out on the water, but before leaving the lake, we felt compelled to return briefly to the spot where we had seen the creature. Remaining in our boat, we scanned the bank for any signs of tracks. We did move closer to the shore for a better look, but we didn't really find anything that's real evidence. We did notice that the ground was littered with the remains of dead fish, though. One of my two friends must have reported the incident, and I was contacted later in the week by the sheriff's department. I spoke with a deputy, and I gave my account of the incident, but I was afraid to give any other information than what he asked for. I did tell the deputy that I was concerned for the creature's well-being, and I hoped that no one would go out and try to hunt for it. I told the deputy that the creature did not pose a threat to anyone or anything. I was concerned that if there was one Bigfoot in the area, there might be a possibility of a larger population. When the deputy said they were going out to have a look, I reminded him of the heavy rainfall in the area within the past few days. Certain parts of Missouri had experienced over 12 inches of rain, and the rainfall could have resulted in the overflowing of rivers and creeks, and it could have submerged the location where we had our encounter. The deputy agreed and said he would just write up the incident. Here's a rundown of things that happened since last summer. Things were pretty quiet for a while, and then we found a footprint in July. I went to bed, and my window was open. I heard it talking outside by my neighbor's house, but it wasn't them. It sounded like teenage girls jabbering, just mumbled enough so you didn't know what was being said. I knew immediately what it was. I decided not to tell my wife, who was sleeping on the couch with a sick kid. That morning I asked if she had heard anything. She said our German shepherd started going nuts around 2 a.m. I found the footprints, one by the wood pile I casted, and others in a bark-dusted area. It looked like something had been looking at our house, and had been lying down or kneeling. It was quiet for the rest of summer, but we heard the donkey cries at least twice per month. My wife actually was sad one night because she thought something had attacked the donkey by the way that it carried on. We thought maybe a cougar. These cries always came from the north. In October, I put mulch on my blueberry plants in the front yard. That night, I thought I heard a wood knock, but I ignored it. The next morning, we awoke to find almost all of the blueberry plants had the mulch taken off and piled in one spot without any trails leading to it. A bear, raccoon, or whatever would have just scattered the stuff. The mulch had been deliberately placed. I found a faint track by the plants, but might have found another track way leading down on the hill in our front yard. It paralleled our dog's track where he chases balls, but this was a new path with what looked like footprints in a straight line. I heard the gunshots in November, automatic, maybe suppressed. My wife and I also heard a whoop from an odd place down the hill from our house next to our neighbors. It started low and ended up in a high pitch, not a scream, just a whoop. We got back from a vacation in Idaho and had been in the city the whole time. The night we got back, December 23rd, we heard a scream. It sounded like a car was spinning its tires in the gravel or mud, only there are no roads on the hill to our east, just thick trees. We almost played it off as traffic, being around it for the past few days, but thought better of it and went inside and stopped unpacking. It sounded like a yell. The last incident, my wife texted me saying there was some weird stuff going on, and she was glad that our dog was there. I was at work and I called her. She said she heard a scream or yell that was angry. There was a lot of gunshots that night, but to hear a scream from in our house, it had to be loud. The house insulates a lot of noise. Both of our dogs and the neighborhood dogs were going crazy. By the time she started recording, the screams had turned into a donkey-type scream. Only this time, it came from the south of us. Our neighbors don't have any livestock that way, and it's mostly wilderness. You can hear on the recording everything going quiet. It was that way until I got home at 12.15am. 
The screams were around 8.15. That's about it. It has been less eventful than last year. As soon as we put up game cameras in our yard, nothing has hit our house or growled at it. It seems they don't like them too much, and it really has worked like a charm. There is still a lot of brush and blind spots that we can't fully get rid of. In fact, my wife saw a pair of red eyes looking at her about a hundred yards away from the neighbor's alder trees. It seems less threatening this time around, but I expect this is the cycle that they are around. Things might pick up for a while and then die down around summertime. Maybe, maybe not. I hope this makes sense. My name is James, and I am 24 years old. I grew up in California, but I now live in Boulder, Colorado. Throughout high school and college, my biggest passion was always the outdoors, and hiking and backpacking was something that I did as much as I possibly could. As I became more experienced, my mission on these trips was always to be as far away from people as I could, meaning that I would seek out trails and destinations that are far from the mainstream. I'm a bit of an introvert, and I just prefer to be as alone as possible. In July 2011, the mission for my best friend and I was to reach the top of Homer's Nose in Sequoia National Park. Back in the 20s, there was a popular trail leading to the top, but for whatever reason, it was essentially removed from the map shortly thereafter. I wrote a trip report once, and the trip was completed on our third attempt. It was along this route that my experience occurred. Please bear with me, as there are some minor details that now seem to add up to the possibility of a Sasquatch encounter. At some point along the route, we decided to call it a day and set up camp for the night, although it was not late, maybe 4 or 5 p.m. My friend Addison was completely beat and crawled inside the tent for a nap before dinner. I, however, was completely buzzing with energy and excitement, as I knew Homer's nose was getting close. I told him I was going to explore a bit while he rested up, and off I went. We had set up camp on an open ridge, so I followed it along until I was back in thick forest again. At some point, I came across a small creek, crossed to the other side, and followed what appeared to be an old game trail. I decided to follow this game trail due to the fact that the rest of the trip we were constantly cutting and breaking branches. This is why it took us three times to be successful. It was nice to finally be able to walk without obstacle. I estimate that I was about a mile and a half to two miles removed from camp at this point, when something very strange happened that stopped me in my tracks. Everything had been quiet for some time, when I suddenly heard a large crashing noise to my left and on the other side of the creek. I froze in my tracks and I turned to look in the direction of the noise, expecting to see a black bear, as I had seen many times before but I saw nothing except for movement in the top portion of the trees. At this point, I thought there must be a bear up in the tree, but I couldn't see anything. All I knew was that from the way the tree was moving, something huge had to be there. And then, almost as suddenly as it had started, the movement stopped, and I was left again in silence. The only thing I can think that it may have been was a bear, based on the sounds and movement of the tree. I originally thought perhaps there was a large bird, but unless there was a pterodactyl present, nothing could have moved a tree like that. I knew that I did not want to mess with anything of that size, so I kept my calm and slowly walked back the way I came. Thankfully, nothing else occurred, and I made it back to camp safely and without incident. I told my friend about it, and we chalked it up to having to be a bear, and thought nothing else of it. It wasn't until this week that I thought about the possibility that there may have been a primate swinging through those trees. The other detail of the story of interest is that earlier in the day, we had come across the bones and remnants of a deer. It was not fresh, but what stood out most to us was the state of the thing. It was ripped to pieces and all over the place, clean breaks too, as if something tore it apart with ease. Again, we attributed this to a bear and thought nothing more of it. As I type this out, I am almost hesitant to click send, because I see no reason why this could not be a bear encounter. I just find it very odd that the tops of the trees were so bent and broken, yet I could not see any animal. The state of the deer body was also disturbing and out of the ordinary, as was the silence leading up to the experience. Somewhere I believe I do have photos of the trip, 
and I did take some photographs of the deer parts. If I can find them, I will certainly send them to you for further analysis, if it piques your interest. I was visiting my sister one summer for a few weeks when this crazy incident occurred. I'll never forget it. Even if I get Alzheimer's one day, it was that traumatic. My name is Sandy, and my sister Katie is a few years older than me. She had finished college and was married and living in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, a resort ski town. I was still in college over in Boulder, and I liked to go visit her on breaks. So one summer break, I wanted to see my sister and also get out of the city, so I went on over to Steamboat. I would guess this happened in about 2005, not all that long ago, really. I hope nobody since then has had this happen to them. My sister said she'd never heard anything like it. Emerald Mountain is a big mountain that has slopes that are steep, but not overly so, so you can hike them. It's pretty big, but I consider it more of a giant hill than a mountain, as it's not like some of the nearby mountains like Mount Werner. It has some big open meadows. One is shaped like a heart, and lots of scrub oak and aspen trees, and then pines up higher. If you drive around its backside, there are some houses and ranches there, but it's pretty much wild terrain. It belongs to the city and the BLM, and there are a bunch of hiking trails up there, as well as an old road to a former quarry. When I was there, you could just kind of take off from the end of the subdivision and hike up as far as you wanted, and there was nobody or anything around, no fences. It was really like being in the wilderness, far from anything, but yet close to home. I liked to go up there with my sister's dog, Smokey, a big gray mutt, because I could let him run and not worry about other dogs being around, like on the other hiking trails. So one day, after I'd been there for a couple of weeks, I decided to go a bit further and make it more of an outing. I packed a little day pack with water for me and Smokey, and some snacks, and then I headed out. I'd guess it was about 10 a.m. We climbed up the mountain following a deer trail, through the scrub oak, and up into the aspens. Once you got into the trees, the going was much easier as it was mostly grasses and wildflowers. We were having a pretty good time. After about an hour or so, we sat on some big rocks and had lunch, which consisted of a granola bar for me and a few dog biscuits for Smokey. We had climbed quite a bit and could see out. I could see the town far below and the flanks of the ski area in the distance to the east. We just hung out there for a long time, watching the magpies and clouds and just enjoying being outside. But all of a sudden, Smokey started acting funny. He wasn't on a leash, and he got up and acted like he was listening to something for a bit. And then he started whining. He then came up to me and kind of nosed my leg, and then turned and started walking back down the mountain. He turned around to see if I was following, and when he saw I wasn't, he came back and repeated the whole thing. I could tell he was getting more and more agitated by the minute. I stood and decided it was time to go back even though I had no idea what was bothering him. And just then, I got the creepiest feeling I've ever had. The hair on my neck stood up, and it felt like I was being watched. I had to fight the urge to run, because if it were a bear, I knew the last thing that I should do is run. It kicks in their predator instincts. I had the sense to get Smokey on a leash, as I didn't want him leaving me there alone. If it were something like a bear or a mountain lion, I might need his protection. We had started down the hill when I first heard the sound. I paused, wondering if my ears were playing tricks on me. Sure enough, there it was again. Not too far above me, someone was calling for help. It was fairly faint, but there was no mistaking it. A distant, help, help, was coming where the aspen were edged by spruce trees, where the forest got thick and dark. I stopped, Smokey pulled on the leash and wanted badly to keep going, but I made him stay with me. I listened. Surely I was hearing things. Why would anyone be up here, and why would they need help? A shiver went down my spine for no reason. There was nothing to be afraid of. I would just go on down the hill and call the sheriff and tell them what I had heard. They could come up and help whoever it was. That would be the smart and prudent thing to do. I felt a sense of relief. I started down the hill again, this time kind of jogging. I needed to hurry back and get someone up here. But I stopped again. 
The call was louder, and it seemed more urgent. I didn't want to have someone die because of my fears, but who could be up there? Maybe someone just like me, a hiker from town. Maybe they had fallen and broken a leg or something. I kept this question and answer session going with myself for a while, trying to decide what I should do, and then again, I heard the cry for help. I decided to yell back and see what happened. I yelled at the top of my lungs. All I heard back was the same cry for help. It was kind of spooky, and my intuition said something was wrong, but something not normal. Now Smokey was pulling hard on the leash, panting, really wanting to go home. This confirmed my hunch that something was definitely not right. I decided to run back down the hill and call the sheriff, as I wanted to do before. This time, I took off running as fast as I could, Smokey pulling me along. I nearly ate it more than once, going down that steep and hummocky hill. When we got back into the oak brush, I had to slow down and wind my way through. It was so thick. I had lost the deer trail. I tried pushing my way through the thick scrub, but it was almost impossible. This area gets a lot of snow in the winter, and enough rain in the summer, that the oak brush can have trunks as thick as a person's leg, and trying to push through can be no easy task. I got through one thicket, and I came into a small clearing, and then stopped for a second to catch my breath. I was holding tight onto Smokey's leash, as he was still shaking and trying to get away to run. I was now pretty scared, but not as scared as I had been up above. Until I heard something to my right, that is. Something not that far away. It sounded like a baby crying. I stood there for a minute, shocked. My reaction was to go over to the area of the sound and look, but Smokey was now totally panicking. He was a pretty good-sized dog, probably part collie, and he literally started pulling me down the hill. There was no way I was going to let go of him, no matter what, as he was the only safety margin I had. I stumbled behind him through the clearing and I let him drag me along, not that I had any choice. He was pretty adept at finding holes in the scrub, although sometimes they weren't big enough for me, but I managed to keep pushing through, though the branches and leaves whipped my face and arms, leaving lots of scratches. We came to another small clearing, and I could now see out enough to gauge where we were. We had somehow steered way off course, and we were headed more into town, towards Howelson Hill, the site of the ski jump and alpine slide. My initial thought was to head back towards the subdivision, but I realized I would have to backtrack up a small hill to avoid a big rock outcropping, and there was no way, so we kept going. I decided once we got to the ski hill, I would hike on down it and then walk back through town. It was way out of the way, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get to where there were people. I stopped for a moment again to catch my breath, though Smokey kept pulling. I was breathing pretty hard, even though it was downhill. Jogging and fighting my way through the scrub oak took a lot out of me. As I stopped, Smokey began growling, but it was different from his normal growl. It was a deep growl, like you'd hear from a wolf or wild animal telling you to stay back. And I mean business growl. He was such a sweet, mellow dog that I was shocked. He was staring at the bushes to my right. I tried to see whatever it was that he could see. All I could make out was a black shadow, and it might just be the way the sun was hitting the scrub oak. But then it moved. I could clearly make out a very large form, at least seven feet tall, and it had shoulders like a football player, but even bigger. Its head came to a bit of a point, but I couldn't make out any features. Once again, Smokey started pulling as hard as he could, trying to get away and run, and I almost lost him. He actually started dragging me so hard, I thought I was going to lose my footing. My hand and arm were sore for days afterwards. He pulled me into another thicket, but this time on a deer trail. We both ran as hard as we could. I was so terrified. I can't explain why, but it was a deep, primal fear, like our ancestors must have had when being pursued by a dire bear or something like that. But it didn't make sense. I hadn't even seen enough to be able to sketch it or anything like that. I wondered if I wasn't maybe letting my fears feed on themselves until I was becoming hysterical. But Smokey's behavior said otherwise. Something was scaring and threatening him. It wasn't just my irrational fear. Suddenly I broke through the brush. It was a road. I had come to the road that went to the top of Howelson Hill. We now started a full-on run as we took off downhill. 
Within just a minute or so, I came upon some hikers going uphill. I ran past them without even saying hello. Soon, I came to more people, but this group was going downhill. I stopped running, and I walked behind them a bit. I was exhausted, and hiking down with them would hopefully provide safety in numbers. I can't tell you how relieved I was. Smokey was also settled down. He still looked spooked, but he wasn't shaking anymore, and he seemed content to be just walking on the road. We got down to the bottom of the hill and walked along the streets back to my sister's house. She was still at work, as it was mid-afternoon by now. Smokey drank lots of water and then went and crawled under my sister's bed, where he apparently slept for the rest of the afternoon, as he didn't come out until she came back. When she came home, I told her what had happened. We agreed that I wouldn't be hiking back up there ever again. We discussed what it could have been, and she asked if maybe we shouldn't call the sheriff. Maybe someone was actually hurt up there. I decided to err on the side of caution and called the sheriff's office, and I told them what happened. They took my number and said they would wait to see if anyone came up missing, but it just wasn't enough evidence to send out a search party. But I knew that no one would come up missing. My intuition and Smokey's actions told me that whatever it was, it wasn't a person, and it wasn't missing. I left a few days later, still feeling pretty unsettled. I didn't even go anywhere those last few days, except to take Smokey for a few walks around town. I had no more desire to be outside in the backcountry. Two weeks after I left, I got a call from my sister. They had decided to move, though it had nothing to do with my experience. They were just really burned out with the winters and the cost of living in a ski town. And they asked if I had heard the news. Two hikers had come down off the mountain with a story of something huge stalking them, and it had first made sounds like a crying baby and then started crying for help. They had gone to the sheriff and also the press, wanting to make sure people knew about it, as they had actually seen it, and they said it was a Bigfoot. It all started in the summer of 2021, when my friend Amber and I decided to take an adventure vacation together. We had been friends since we were kids, and ever since, she'd always had a fascination with the Tongrass National Forest. We figured it would be the perfect spot for us to escape reality, and just enjoy some time outdoors, away from all of our worries. We often went out for drinks together or shopping outings, but this trip was different. We really wanted to spend some quality time alone with each other, so that's why we opted to rent an A-frame cabin, which was available at a very reasonable price from the Forest Service. Even though we were both experienced campers, we figured it would be easier to just rent a cabin to get away from it all. The day before our departure, we both packed up our things, ready for the weekend ahead of us. We were both so excited. We knew that this opportunity would be a great chance for us to reconnect and get back in touch with nature. When we arrived at the cabin, we could already feel ourselves begin to relax and let go of all of our worries. The next morning, after a good night's rest, we ate breakfast and gathered up all of our supplies before beginning our journey into the forest. As soon as we stepped outside, we could feel something different in the air. We had been walking for several hours and finally decided to take a break on a ridge that overlooked the magnificent landscape surrounding us. Just as we began taking in our surroundings, we heard an unexpected sound coming from nearby. At first it was hard to figure out what it was, but then I realized it was a porcupine. We were both mesmerized by this beautiful creature as it continued on its way through the forest. After watching the porcupine disappear into the distance, we took some time to marvel at how incredible nature was. Eventually, though, after admiring our surroundings for some time longer, we decided it was time to get up and continue on our hike. We hiked for a few more hours, with the sun beginning to set on the horizon, so we decided to make our way back to the cabin. We had been enjoying a relaxing evening in our cabin, a perfect end to an amazing day, we were chatting about what we had seen on our hike and dreaming up plans for the days ahead, when suddenly, from somewhere outside of the walls of our cabin, we heard a loud, mysterious sound. We both immediately went quiet, our eyes wide, and we tried to figure out what this strange noise could be. It was like some kind of deep howl, but we both had never heard it before. We listened carefully as it continued and then eventually faded away. 
Our curiosity quickly got the better of us, and we decided to go outside to try to get a better sense of what exactly this noise was. We stepped outside and listened, and sure enough, we heard it again. It was so long and loud, unlike anything either of us had ever heard. It resembled an old-fashioned fire truck, winding up with sound, like a deep rumble made from low frequencies. Now that we were outside, we could physically feel the sound, in our chests, as it echoed through the night. After sitting there for a few more minutes, the howl dissipated, and then we heard sounds of wood in the distance. It almost sounded like something was knocking against large tree trunks. The sound repeated a few more times over the course of five minutes. We decided to go back inside. We talked for a while about the sounds that we heard. We tried to piece it together, but we had no answers. We decided that the next day, it would be interesting to head towards the direction that we heard the howl come from, since we were already planning to hike in that area anyways. We thought that maybe if we explored it, we could find some signs of what had made the noises. The next day, we packed our bags and set off into the woods, although we couldn't help but feel nervous, because we had no idea what had made those sounds. What if this animal was dangerous? We walked for about an hour in the direction where we heard the sound, and then Amber noticed something in the woods. We looked at each other with a mix of awe and fear as we stared at the structure in front of us. It was made out of large branches, stacked together almost like a teepee. We approached it cautiously, not knowing if there was a creature in it or lurking around nearby. We looked inside the structure, and it seemed as if something had been using it as a type of primitive living space. The ground was matted, but there was no sign of anything around. Still curious, we went further into the woods, in search for more clues about what kind of creature could have made the noises. We spent hours hiking, looking for signs. Eventually, we headed back to the cabin for the night, as we had gotten tired and hungry from our search. We were relaxing when we were startled, and we heard the same howls from the night before, but they seemed much closer. We stood outside the cabin, just like we had done the previous night. We wanted to hear the noises more clearly, and figure out which direction they were coming from. Sure enough, there was the howl, and again, much closer than before. The sound was powerful, and it shook our chests. About five minutes of intensely listening for any other signs, we heard a familiar sound. Wood knocks, coming from nearby trees on our left side. We quickly turned and to our surprise, we saw a large creature thumping against one of these trees. It was tall, and it had a large body that was covered in thick, dark hair. Its eyes were deep-set, and it gleamed in the night light. Its long arms hung down to its knees while it pounded away on the trunk. We had seen our first Bigfoot. We watched this creature, its face a mix of human-like features and animalistic qualities. Its fur was dark brown, and it had two deep-set eyes that glistened. Although we felt an intense presence from this creature, it seemed non-threatening, as if saying just stay away from my home and there won't be any trouble. After a few seconds, it turned away from us and disappeared into the forest. We quickly figured it would be best to head back into the cabin and wait until morning when we could investigate further. After all, we had no idea what this creature might do if provoked or startled. When morning came, we cautiously walked back to the area where we had seen the creature. To our relief, it was obviously no longer there, but there were some clear indentations of footprints heading back into the forest, which confirmed that the events of the previous night were indeed real. We figured it was best not to pursue the creature again, and headed back to the safety of our cabin. We had one more night here, and we debated whether or not we should stay or leave in light of what happened. We decided to stay, but keep a closer eye on our surroundings. That night, we heard the same howl from before, but this time it seemed far away, like it had the first night. As soon as the sun rose, we quickly packed our bags and left. On our way home, we discussed what we had seen and speculated its behavior. Had we stumbled upon its home on that hike, and it decided to follow us back to the cabin to warn us to stay away? It certainly seemed like that. This was truly an amazing experience that will live with us forever. Those few nights made us question everything we had known. To this day, we have never gone back there. Instead, we have decided to keep our outings together to safer events, like meeting up for drinks or shopping. This experience taught us to respect the forest and be more aware of our environment when we venture into wild places.
I'll tell this story on behalf of my grandpa, who told it to me many years ago. He swore it was true, and I actually checked the newspaper for that time, and sure enough, there was a train wreck exactly like he had told about, except they left one part out, the part about what caused it. I guess it was just too outlandish for them to expect anyone to believe. Or, they had their reputation as a newspaper to worry about. Or maybe they just didn't know. But my grandpa told the story just a tad differently, and he was there. My grandpa was a traveling man, and he used to ride the rails. He was young and wanted to see the country, and it was the only way you could do it if you were poor, which he was. Back then, in the 1930s, a lot of guys traveled this way. Nobody had any money. It was the Great Depression. My dad's family is all from Oregon, and that's where my great-grandparents lived. My grandpa was in his early 20s when this happened, but he was still pretty much living at home. When he was around, that is. I know his parents worried about him, probably with good reason, as I think he was pretty wild. He loved trains. Later, he became a train engineer. That's how much he loved them. And he loved trains until he died. I think that when he was young, he was going for train rides just to be on the trains, not even to travel. When he died, he left a huge collection of train memorabilia to the train museum in Colorado, where he had moved when he started his train career. I think maybe after this incident, he didn't want to be on trains in Oregon much. I have to digress here for a moment and tell you about my grandpa's little dog, Hobo. She was a beagle, and he taught her what the word train meant. After he retired, he lived not too far from the tracks, so he could go and see his beloved trains. And that crazy dog would sit there and listen for them, and then go berserk, baying and whining, until the train came by. And then she would sit there, pointing at it with her paw, like she was telling Grandpa to look. She could hear the trains coming long before the rest of us, and he called her his train detective. Everyone always got a kick out of this silly little dog. Grandpa actually took her on a train once. But I don't know if she made the connection or not. She probably did, as she was smart as a whip. Actually, Grandpa took me on a train a number of times, and now I'm a train engineer too. So Grandpa was riding this empty train, somewhere in central or northern Oregon. I don't recall what line it was, and he and a couple of other railroad bums were holed up in a boxcar, trying to stay warm and out of the wind. He said it was about mid-train, and it wasn't a really big train that day maybe 25 cars and two engines. Not huge, but sizable enough. The cars were all empty, so the train was making good time. These other two guys he was riding with, he'd met them somewhere or other, but they weren't really friends, just acquaintances, which is how it usually was riding the rails. You'd meet someone, ride along together for a while, and then your paths would diverge, and maybe you'd meet them again someday, maybe not. My grandpa didn't really care for the company he was keeping, so he couldn't sleep. He didn't trust them and thought they might rob him or worse, even though he only had five bucks to his name. So he was sitting there kind of nodding off and then waking up again from the cold. A boxcar isn't the best digs one hopes for in the winter. It's a miracle they didn't all freeze to death, and that did occasionally happen. He heard the whistle blow and the train started slowing down. This was kind of odd, because they were in the middle of nowhere. There must be something on the track. He crawled up to the top of the car, but it was too cold to stay up there for long, and he didn't see anything but steam coming from the engine, which was normal. He slumped down into the car, and the other two guys slept. Now the train was slowing even more, and he didn't know what to make of it. The cars were bumping against each other like trains do when they come to a stop, and the brakes were squealing and then all of a sudden, the train was speeding up again. Just then, they went through a very dark tunnel. He wondered if something wasn't in that tunnel, and the engineer didn't want to hit it. Maybe a moose or something. The train was back up to full speed, and then it was slowing again. What was going on? He crawled up to the top of the car again, but this time, what he saw gave him the chills. Something big and black was walking along the top of the train, balancing on the top of the cars like it was nothing. Only a monkey could do something like this, and whatever it was did look a bit monkey-like, even though he said it was much bigger. He slumped back down into the car. What was he supposed to think? A big gorilla walking along the top of the train. He must be dreaming, 
and then he wondered if he should wake the other guys up to verify if he was crazy or not. He decided not. They were better off sleeping, and he was likewise better off with them sleeping. There was something about the pair that he didn't like, and the train continued to slow. My grandpa knew that something was wrong. The engineer was having some kind of problems, but there wasn't anything he could do about it, slumped down in a boxcar halfway back in the train. He crawled back up to take a look and almost got stepped on by yet another gorilla creature. He was right smack behind it, so it didn't see him. He just about had a heart attack, he said. The thing walked on down the train cars like it was walking down a flat level street, nary a worry about falling off the moving train. Now my grandpa started thinking, maybe it was time to abandon ship while the train was still going slow. He would be stranded in the middle of the forest in winter, who knows how far from civilization, but maybe he could hop the next train that came through. The thing that worried him was what if there were more of these creatures in the forest, and he went from the frying pan to the fire. He had heard tales from other hobos about traveling through Oregon and Washington, tales with characters just like these gorilla things. He had thought they were a result of too much alcohol, but maybe they were real. His hobo companions just slept through all of it. They must be warmer than he was or full of whiskey, he figured. The train slowed almost to a stop, and he decided it was time. He crawled to the open door and jumped. He landed on the edge of the railroad berm, rolling down into what ended up being a ditch full of weeds and snow. Remember, this is a young and very agile young man. If he tried to do something like that now, he would probably break something. The train rolled slowly on and was soon gone. All was silent. The snow had stopped falling, and my grandpa now wondered if he had done the right thing. He made his way over to the edge of the forest, hiding. He would sit it out and try to stay warm until dawn. Maybe another train would roll through and he could wave it down, though that was unlikely, as these engineers usually weren't too happy about giving out free rides but a man out in the middle of the forest might be different. Then he remembered how it can sometimes take these big trains a mile or more to stop. He would have to slow one down somehow and hop on, and he had no idea how that would work. He sat there in the cold, wondering if he was crazy to have jumped off the train, when he noticed two black figures not too far from him, kind of doing the same thing, standing in the edge of the forest. He knew it was the gorilla things. He now wished he hadn't jumped, as it appeared they had also. He was scared to death and just stood there, hoping they wouldn't notice him. But now he was getting stiff from the cold. He had to do something. Either start a fire or walk around to try to stay warm. If he didn't, he would freeze. He was already starting to shiver, the first sign of hypothermia. He wondered how long it would be until dawn. Now he heard something the likes of which he never heard before or since. It sounded like it was miles away, a huge crashing noise, the sound of grinding and metal twisting, and above all, a shrieking. The train, it had wrecked, and it sounded like it had been moving really along, and he was now glad that he had jumped. He could now hear someone talking in the distance, and he realized it was the two forms that he had seen. They must be humans, so he decided to go see, even though he was very nervous. He decided to skirt the forest, kind of staying behind the trees a bit so they wouldn't see him. It didn't take him long to get near them, and sure enough, there were two men standing there, talking quietly. He sure didn't want to hook up with his companions again, so he stood there a while, watching and listening, making sure it wasn't them before revealing himself. He stepped out of the forest and quietly said, Hello, fellas. Sounds like that train just bit the dust. Were you on it? The two guys were shocked to see him, jumping back a bit. He told them, and come to find out, they were the engineer and brakeman. They had purposely slowed the train down enough so they could themselves jump. My grandpa was shocked, to say the least. A good crew never abandoned the train, but he knew why. They didn't even need to tell him. They built a big fire and stayed close until dawn. My grandpa got the story from them that cold night in the Oregon forest. And it was a story he barely believed himself, even though he had been there and seen the creatures. It seems the engineer had seen something on the tracks, something big, and had slowed down not to hit it, sounding the whistle. The thing stepped aside, just as they were nearly on it, 
and the engineer about had a heart attack when he saw what it was. He thought he saw the beast reach out and grab the rail on the side of the engine, pulling itself onto the train, just as they entered the tunnel. And then he radioed the brakeman, who quickly came up. They discussed what he'd seen, and the brakeman decided to take a look, going to the side of the engine and stepping out onto the catwalk. He came face to face with the thing, and he himself about had a heart attack. He jumped back in, slamming the door and bracing it, and then ran back to the engineer with his report, who informed him that he had seen a second one on board. It had actually leaned down from the top of the engine and peered into the window at him. The engineer now put the train into high gear, thinking maybe a good bit of speed would knock the things off, or they wouldn't be able to hold on. He thought about radioing in and telling dispatch what was going on, and then decided he didn't need to lose his job, as they would think he was drinking. Now the one beast was hanging off the side of the engine, trying to break in through the side door, and it sounded like another one was up on top. They needed a plan, but all they could think of was to somehow abandon the train without the beast knowing, letting the whole thing roll on down the line. They knew it would eventually crash with no one manning the brakes, but they had to get off before these beasts broke in. The brakeman now came up with an idea. He would go to the second engine and open the door, and then quickly run back to the first engine. This would hopefully divert the beasts while the two men bailed out the side door. But they needed to slow the train down enough to make an exit. The engineer got on his radio and sent out a message that the train was out of control and they were going to jump with an approximate location. They needed someone to come find them, he said. Soon they had the train slowed down and the brakeman went to the back engine and opened the door, yelling out to the wind. He ran to the first engine, and they both jumped into the night, hoping they were unseen. Apparently the Bigfoot hadn't seen them jump, and the train rolled on down the line to its demise. They were rescued the next day by an engine pulling a caboose with a rescue crew. It had to push the caboose back the way they came, as the tracks weren't passable ahead from the big train wreck. My grandpa quit riding the rails after that, which made his parents very happy. He said he always wondered what happened to the two characters in the boxcar there with him. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening.